ShotGlassDigital.com. Rebel Force Radio's Fangirls Going Rogue is brought to you by Little Debbie Snacks and their new Cosmic Cupcakes. Rebel Force Radio presents... Hello, what have we here? Fangirls Going Rogue. I met her in a Jedi chat room. Star Wars news, topics, and conversation from the female point of view. I like the sound of that. With Trisha Barr and Teresa Delgado. This is Fangirls Going Rogue. Welcome, fanboys and fangirls, to another episode of Fangirls Going Rogue, brought to you by our friends and yours at Rebel Force Radio. I'm your host, Teresa Delgado, and with me, I'm keeping it the same, just so you know, my rogue leader, Trisha Barr. Oh, hey, Teresa. I'm in withdrawal, so... <sighs> I know, it's been two weekends that you have not been at Star Wars Weekends, and I've had to fly our fangirl flag solo. I know. I wasn't a very good wingman the last two weeks. It might have been, I might have just been worn out from week two, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting worn out. I mean, I love Star Wars Weekends. I'm excited for the fifth one, but at the same time, I'm going to be real happy when it's over. I am so tired. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how you keep doing it. I'm. I'm. I'm so tired. I can't even like favorite or re- retweet anything. I just watch it. and I'm like, ooh, yay, woo! No energy left. <laughs> well, you know, this past weekend I had some great help from Aaron Goins from Bookworms. He came back down, and Riley Blanton from the Star Wars Report came back down. So they helped keep me going. And on this past weekend, weekend four on Saturday, we did all the shows back to back to back. So it was like, get in line, go see a show. Go get in line. Go see a show. Go get in line. Go see a show. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> but it was pretty good, though, you know, because there's shade and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, the shade's the most important part. Well, we um, have done several different uh, podcasts where we, we have talked about our excitement from the Rebel Force Radio meetup. That was week two, the week that literally exhausted me to the point that I have proved that I am an old lady and I can't keep up with Teresa anymore. So you've been we horse were, racing or something. Yes. I've been, yes, I've been with Ganner the Jedi horse off in Kentucky. So, and I had a big, huge presentation for work that went really well. So that was exciting. Um, so yes, I've been doing the, um, non fangirl real life things too, but I really just wanted to say thank you to Jimmy Mack for organizing the Rebel Force Radio meetup and for Steve Lawson, who is with him, who we have literally the most epic photo bomb ever with him in it. And I laugh every time that pops up on Facebook because it keeps popping up on Facebook. It's awesome. It's so great. And we miss Jason. We're sorry he wasn't there. And we look forward to seeing him soon. But my favorite moment, and I I have to bring this up because you can listen to our fangirl chat, which I'll provide a link to. You can also listen to us talk on Star Wars Report about Riley and Bethany's first Disney experience that was Star Wars Weekend. But Jimmy Mack, he... He mentions in the Rebel Force Radio, it's in the show, so go listen to his recap to his show. He mentions that fangirl, the word fangirl, made it into the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and he talked about the meetup, and that was my most excited, favorite moment. Um, It was an exciting moment anyway, and then for him to acknowledge it was really, really, really cool. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Yeah, we also want to thank um, Al John from Sorcerers, Sorcerers Radio for mentioning our Star Wars Weekends tips blog that we did on the Star Wars blog. Um, and then also Paul, who cosplays as the bad robot, because he was so kind and awesome and amazing. And, yeah, these guys just rock. Um I also want to thank Ryan from Turtle Power Podcast, because he was... Just amazingly kind, and um, all these people are so awesome. I know, and 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 Teresa. When I met him, I was like, Teresa likes Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm like, oh my gosh! When I met him, so I was really excited for you. But it was great because he was dressed like Indiana Jones. <laughs> so yeah, I was confused. Was like, I was like, yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Why are you dressed like Indiana Jones? <laughs> 
there are things that go through my head that I don't actually tell people. So, Ryan, if you're listening, I had a very confusing moment. So if my dialogue and our conversation was a little disjointed, it's because in my head I'm like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Jones. (laughs) (laughs) And... I also, and I, did, did you meet him too, Christoph, who was our first email? Yes, I did. I think you introduced him to me really briefly. Okay. I mean, that was the thing. Teresa and I were like, oh my gosh, we met all these people, all these fabulous people. And we are so excited to meet everyone. And then we we're like, oh, I have to remember everybody's name. So everybody who posted Facebook pictures and then tagged us in it, thank you so much. Because now I can remember everybody's name. I'm like, oh, I remember who that person is and that person. And I got to take a picture with Chica Fent. So did I. Me. Well, you had already, and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I got to catch up. That took me a week or two or three, so. (laughs) We also want to thank Richard and Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland for having both of us on the show to chat about um, Star Wars weekends, and then also just for flat, you know, being brave enough to hang out with us in person. Yeah, we rode the mine car together before it was open. Woo! (laughs) We also did some... Some jumping around, fangirl flailing in our her universe out attire over Magic Kingdom, closing down the park there. Yeah. And we had a lot of fun. We also got to hang out with Eric Schenevice from Star Wars Books. And then obviously Riley and Bethany from Star Wars Report. So all the people that we got to see. And they were, they were doing like musical uh, podcasts at the Rebel Force Radio meetup. So that was really cool. Yeah, and we also got to hang out with Aaron Goins, my co-host from Bookworms. Um, golly, there was, I swear there's other people that I'm forget, forgetting. Um, Jedi Schwa from Techno Retro Dads um, and the Tron Decoded podcast, which are both on the Shot Glass Digital um, Network. Oh, man, so many people. But we really just want to thank everybody for coming out, hanging out, talking to us, and being so supportive because we do this show for you. We really do. And for us a little bit, too, because we like to talk. But more so for you than anybody else. Um, We also wanted to mention really quick, we did some, we did a recap on the Star Wars report. Um, We also have some stuff that we, that aired on one of the latest episodes of Rebel Force Radio. Um, I just recently went on the Force cast. You can find that. And we have released a couple new episodes of our Fangirl Chat, which is on YouTube. So if you find the YouTube channel Fangirl Chat, we did some stuff on there as well. I know. And so that one of the really fun one is uh, Teresa recapped her visit to the Disney Store Media event. So that was a lot of fun for me to listen to. So people should definitely check it out and listen to how she, you know, she just went over everything that they talked about and all the things they introduced. And it's really fun to hear because she was so excited. And I just got to ask questions and, you know, find out how, you know, that experience went. So so Teresa's like totally on Disney overload at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah, at that point, it really, really was. <laughs> so, but the whole, everything was the, I think Disney just has done a great job with Star Wars Weekends for being the shepherd of it and, um, you know, bringing it forward. So what I, uh, I was, had so much fun. I had so much fun that it just, two weeks of it and I was down for the count. So, you know. As Star Wars Weekend's veterans, I feel like Disney really stepped up its game, but I'm wondering how someone new to the event felt, and now I'm feeling like we really should have scheduled a guest. Well, you know what? I actually might have somebody, so give me just a sec. I'm going to see if I can get her. Vanessa, are you there? I'm right here. Hi. Yay! Yeah, turned out I brought Vanessa Marshall to the voice of Harris and Dula from Star Wars Rebels? That's right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I am so excited. I think I just fangirl flailed, but I had to keep my headset on. <laughs> oh, Welcome man. to Fangirls Going Rogue. Awesome. I'm so happy to be here. I love you guys. <laughs> well, we love you, and we're getting to record with you after you got to do your very first Star Wars weekend. So we have to ask you. What was the one thing that you remember the most about Star Wars Weekends? You know, it, there were so many things, it's so hard to narrow it down. I mean, because there were so many moments that were truly sublime. Uh, I think 
the parade blew my mind, definitely. Uh, that was so awesome to, you know, hear that music and be in the car and, and have sort of everything come together at once. Meeting Peter Mayhew, I mean, <laughs> meeting Chewbacca, seriously? <laughs> I, I just had these moments where it was almost like my spine was electrocuted, where I was like, how is this my life? <laughs> you know, and I got my first mouse ears. Um, and then I got so many cool gifts from fans. Uh, Allison Berrios of Cosplay for Jedi, she made me these Leku, um, and I, I brought them out at the Behind the Force show. Um, and that was just so dear and wonderful. And then plus there was the Her Universe store in uh, the Darth Mall, which was insane because I normally have to order everything online. But to be able to like physically feel all the merchandise and get what was missing in my collection, I mean, seriously. And not to mention, I got to see you guys. So, you know, really it's hard to say what was the best because most of it was just nonstop pure joy for me <laughs> i have to say that the you're getting the mouse ears was pretty awesome so oh, man that was <laughs> man i mean getting to do stomp with the mod best and james arnold taylor yeah. how cool I, is I that mean, it, seriously where where do you have all day because i could go on and on about how great it was i mean and it was peter's birthday and there was a millennium falcon cake come on like the whole time i literally <laughs> it's just flailing completely did, did you get to eat any of that cake <laughs> i did not i did not i had to go to uh an autograph signing right after so i i don't know where that cake went but i'm sure it was awesome um yeah i, I mean just it, it was one thing after another and next year if i go i really hope that i can spend more time just uh you know spending time in the park uh we went over to um the Beauty and the Beast dinner, you know, uh, be our guest or whatever. And I got to have the gray stuff. That was awesome. Um, the cutest thing, there was a mom with her daughter uh, in the dining room, and the daughter was watching Beauty and the Beast on her little iPad, and she was eating her dinner in the Belle outfit. And I just, oh, it was so adorable. <laughs> I just Aww. love that Disney World provides that kind of fun for kids and adults, actually. But, uh yeah, it was really, uh, every moment was so cool. Absolutely. We got to see some really cool videos, and there was introduction with you and Freddie Prince Jr. and Tia, and they and so you were recording as a team, and you guys get to record as sort of a unit. Do you think that helps enhance your performance? Oh, definitely. I really do. It, you know, everyone in the cast, they have such great senses of humor. And I think when we interact with one another, there's, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, uh, when families sort of converse with each other, there's a shorthand and uh, like a level of, of intimacy that, you know, it's, it's not always the nicest communication, but it's hilarious and, uh, and it makes it more real. Uh, I think we, we are like that in real life. And then when, we're all together, it sort of lends itself uh, to, uh, you know, creating what feels more like real interactions. Uh, and we have fun doing it. I, I love working with everyone in the cast. Every, everyone is really, really cool. And uh, uh, Dave Filoni sort of leads us, and uh, we have like a group huddle before we start, and then we just dive in all together, and it's, it, I think it makes a huge difference. So we got to see a really cool clip and a clip we haven't seen before during the Behind the Force show. And I was just kind of curious, have you seen that clip before you saw it during the show? No, I had not. And it was amazing. Uh, it was so cool to see. the. I remember Ahsoka's eyes in the Clone Wars. They were always so uh, alive and uh, you know, her, the, those eyes, they just, they, they make you care about her. And I didn't realize that Hera's eyes were so sparkly. You know, there was so much going on and um, the little quippy remarks, like you have no idea how any of that is going to translate. And uh, to see it sort of all put together, it gave me a better sense of how she maneuvers in her ghost. And it was really helpful to see it. 
um, and you get a sense of sort of the relationship with Chopper and Kanan and uh, yeah, it was it was really helpful to see. I, I no longer well, have to imagine. I, I now know sort of you know what what's going on. <laughs> We were definitely blown away by the clip. So oh, it good. I'm so glad. It's beautiful. The banter. And so that was um, more of a Hera, Kanan, and Chopper clip. And you've described Hera as this character who inspires everyone to dig deeper and discover their kind of ruthless selflessness, the necessary to fuel and complete the mission. And I really love that. That's very kind of Katniss Everdeen. Mm. And in the clip, we see Chopper, and uh, Dave Filoni's described him as the family cat, so he's kind of doing his own thing. So does Hera inspire this ruthless selflessness in Chopper, or is he just doing his own thing? Chopper listens to no one. Chopper is that cranky cat who will just do as she pleases, you know, and not that Chopper is female, but, you know, it's just the household cat. He's like, meh, can't be bothered. Yeah, you're lucky if Chopper listens. <laughs> so I don't even think Chopper's capable of <laughs> ruthless selflessness. <laughs> but but he really comes through for us, man. On that back gunner, when he gets back there and gets it done for me, there's certain TIE fighters I just can't reach in front, you know. Um, I just think it's so cool. I, I love stuff. That's huh? the first time you ever see a droid do anything like that. Yeah, yeah. He's and, and then. And then the, the arms sort of add a little more emotion to him. So. Yeah, like when he was bonking his head, you know, like bonk, 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 you know, and I tell him, get back there, I know you're fixing whatever, and he's like, bang, bang, bang. That was hilarious. <laughs> I definitely yeah. think he's going he's gonna to bring some comedy to the show, similar to how R2 and 3PO did, but like all, all by himself. Totally, absolutely. Yeah. So in... In many of your recent interviews that you've done, you've mentioned that you're a Star Wars fan, and you've talked about your personal journey through Star Wars. So we always ask our guests what being a fangirl means to them. So now that you're the voice behind Harrison Dula, and what has that done for your fandom? Well, it's had an interesting impact. I, I'm sort of new to Twitter, and I didn't realize that all these fantastic ladies were out there. Like I said, it was more of sort of a private experience. So Twitter has literally blown my mind. Um, I feel so close to so many female fans and male fans, too, actually. But, uh, you know, as far as fangirls go, um, I just I think it's really lovely what Ashley has done with her universe, uh, providing us fashion so that we no longer have to buy boys t-shirts and look like truck drivers um <laughs> that <laughs> there's actually fashionable um things that that you know are not uh, the wrong size or whatever but um it's kind of affected my cosplay options <laughs> um, <laughs> i know well but it's weird because bo katan is one of my favorite characters and I met someone in the 501st out here in Los Angeles, and I there was a cosplay event that I was invited to, and I, was, I called this guy, and he didn't know who the heck I was. He was like, what? I said, hey, can you make me a bow katana? I want to go to this thing and really rock the gear. And uh, there was not enough time, um, and he ended up meeting me at the event. His name's Kevin Weir, and uh, he's he's amazing. His um, helmets and gear, they're, they're really, he's an amazing artist. But... Um, yeah, so then I was talking to Dave Filoni, and he was like, no, I don't think you can wear the bow katan, you know, because that's that's sort of weird. Uh, you know, you didn't originate that role. Uh, you know, Katie Sackhoff, uh, that, that's her character, blah, blah, blah. And I was kind of like, oh, wow, I hadn't really considered that. And he's like, you can wear all the green leku you want, but, uh, uh, you know, you may want to just be respectful of the other women who originated those roles. So that's kind of... That I I was I that shocked me. Um, I mean, I'm sure if I wore some stormtrooper outfit and I was under the helmet the whole time, I don't think I would be insulting anybody. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's just it's it's strange to be a part of the franchise in a way that is so signature. In other words, you know, I'm a Twi'lek and a pilot and have certain gear and this and that. And believe me, I'm happy to dress up <laughs> as a Twi'lek, but um, hadn't really considered 
what it would be like to sort of step into the world itself, and then when I'm not in it, that I that I am really representing Hera. I mean, no one else has played Hera previous to this, and I'm sort of forging new ground in that way, and then at the same time, I can't really circle back and walk the con floors as Ayla Sakura or, <laughs> you know. Um, so that that was sort of interesting to learn. Um but overall, I, I love the fangirls. Amy Ratcliffe, I was so happy to meet her, and I met her at WonderCon. And um, there are just so many really cool women out there who are writing great stuff uh, on the Mary Sue, and you guys blow my mind all the time. Um, but uh, I feel less alone, to be honest with you. It's, it's really cool. That's the fun part about it. Yeah. yeah. Just... I mean, and it's so had... weird because when I met you guys at uh, – the Star Wars weekends, I feel like I've known you my whole life. I mean, I know that's not possible, but there's sort of a, a shorthand. I, I can't explain it, but it's just, it's so lovely that, that people, you know, who've just sort of been communicating on Twitter can hang out together, and it's just like falling off a log. Um, that's, that's a really special thing that, you know, people say technology is so bad, but I'm really grateful to Twitter um, and Facebook and all these means to sort of uh, participate in conversations with people that I wouldn't otherwise know. So um, I love it. There you go. So we ask two questions on our show, and the second one is, what is what do you think is the most underrated thing about Star Wars? Gosh, you know, everything is so... Uh, not overrated, but there, I mean, what isn't to love with Star Wars? I think what was new to me um, and maybe was underrated where I was concerned, uh, and I was unaware of the charity work that the 501st does and the Rebel Legions do all over the world, um, the Star Wars in the classroom, uh, people who are you know teaching Star Wars to kids, sort of dealing with major themes and... and um, the dynamics, the, the mythic elements within the Star Wars universe. Uh, you know, Wes, Ian, Thomas, Dan, Zare, uh, those guys at Star Wars in the Classroom have actually become uh, a special ops rogue <laughs> on their website. It's pretty cool. Um, I don't really have a chance to teach children, but um, I definitely am talking about Star Wars pretty much everywhere <laughs> I go. Um, but I would say... Uh, but that was something I was not as familiar with. Um, and I was very moved to see when we went to the Children's Hospital on May the 4th Be With You. Um, on May 4th, when we went to the Children's Hospital and Darth Vader was there and Bo- or, um, Boba Fett and uh, R2. And to see these kids, the joy in their faces, to dance with R2-D2. And, uh, you know, it really, I, I got to see firsthand how wonderful Star Wars is for so many people. Um, and that that was something that I didn't know about previously. It is pretty neat what they do, and they, they do a whole lot of work. And hopefully you'll get to be involved in more of that as time goes on. Um, yeah, definitely. So since you are such a huge Star Wars fan, we have to ask a couple of questions because I always love – hearing where people stand on things so first oh, okay. what's your favorite star wars film well you know what is interesting um i would say before seeing the clone wars it would have been a new hope uh, there was something about that because it just propelled me into a whole new universe I, I would have said a new hope but after watching the clone wars for me return of the jedi was absolutely amazing that final scene uh you know when darth vader kills palpatine to save his son and uh you know there's there's redemption and there it's just the completion of so many rich arcs that 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 was the most rewarding moment for me um and i I really think i thank clone wars for that because they really fleshed out anakin i know the prequels did as well but i cared so much about the Anakin and the Ahsoka in Clone Wars that it deeply impacted the original trilogy for me. Um, So today I would say Return of the Jedi. And I love that I can say today because I think that's what's really cool about the Star Wars (laughs) universe is that it can sort of move and grow with you and you, you can discover new things even though you think you already know everything. There's always something more to learn. Um, And that's definitely the case with the EU and all that stuff. But, um, 
Yeah. Exactly. So, I, hey, Trisha. Trisha, <laughs> Trisha, I got it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's ter- that? Teresa's, Teresa's favorite is Return of the, is Return of the Jedi. So, hey. more so... I'm always, yeah, I'm always on the hunt for more Return of the Jedi lovers over Empire Strikes Back. So yes, <laughs> you know, I just I just rewatched the Yoda arc from the Clone Wars, and yeah. I'm more in love with Empire Strikes Back after <laughs> watching Yoda stuff. So. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I did, and I love that that you can do that, that you can rewatch things, and it's just amazing. So. In going into Clone Wars, because I know how much you love the Clone Wars, do you have a favorite story arc from Clone Wars or a favorite episode? You know, um, for the longest time, I was really impressed with the Night Sisters story arc and Savage Opress and Asajj Ventress sort of, you know, returning and, and discovering more of her backstory, sort of where she came from and how it made her relationship with Dooku so much more sinister and... Um, you know, as with Anakin, he has such a, a uh, an amazing backstory. He's not just Darth Vader. He's someone who lost his mom. He lost his wife. He doesn't know where his children are. I mean, anyway, for me, that Night Sisters arc really beautifully laid out all sorts of new discoveries for me. And then, of course, you bring back Darth Maul. What? That was <laughs> amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you know what, though? I was thinking about this. Season 3... Do you remember the Trandoshans arc um, mm-hmm. when oh, it the... was captured? How, I mean, that animation was so beautiful. I mean, so the little details on all the, um, the you know, tree branches and all the stuff that they were running over, as, uh, I think his name was Garnak, was chasing after them. They were on the hunt to kill them. And uh, when Khalifa died, I, it, it, that was really, I think, uh, a great example of what they can do in animation, the world that they created. And they created so many in Clone Wars, but that world in particular was just beautiful. That arc is kind of overlooked, I think, too, like that storyline with the mm-hmm. Trandoshans. And I actually really, really enjoyed it. And there were so many different yeah. voices and stuff in that. It was amazing. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so, definitely. Like, I didn't know that James Arnold Taylor did one of the voices of one of them until... His show during Star Wars Weekend. Circle it all back. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's amazing, isn't he? Yeah. We get to learn all the, all those cool little little voices that we didn't realize that they they did during the show. So that's always fun. Yeah. And his, his Plo Koon was epic. <laughs> always epic. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> James Bond Taylor, he rocked our world. He came by and stopped by the Rebel Force Radio meetup at, uh, in week two. And I think everybody was just sort of melting. Just Yay. We're so excited he came and talked to everybody. So that was really great. Um, He's such an open heart. He's such a sweet guy. Just true, true talent and just a, a wonderful guy. He is. So we, the great thing about Star Wars is we don't just have movies coming up. We have Rebels coming up. We also have new books coming up. And one of them by John Jackson Miller has Hera on the cover with Kanan, and it's called A New Dawn. So it appears like you guys have a little history. So do you know any of this history? Or are you going to be a fangirl with the rest of us and reading this and learning about them, too? I, yeah, I will be a fangirl flailing with you and learning as I go. Uh, I mean, I have sort of a vague sense that they've known each other for a long time, but in what capacity, it's somewhat unclear, and I think that's going to sort of unfold as the show continues, and it'll probably be impacted by the book, and um, I'm not I'm not really sure. I, I am excited to learn, you know, it, how helpful would that be to get more backstory, you know, as to sort of how they met and how she inspired him to join the rebel cause and, you know, maybe what order 66 was like for him and where was he in his training and, you know, how, how did I salvage the crew on the ghost sort of, you know, when did uh, his character come into that whole thing? So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to read that. I think it'll be really helpful. Teresa, are you going to do that on bookworms? Of course we are. Come on Uh now. Come on, we're a book podcast. Can't yeah? You know, I think you know, and I think for people who read the books and stuff like that, 
getting these books that are going to tie into Rebels, and hopefully they, they do more than this, I think this mm-hmm. is just going to enhance Rebels. And oh, yeah. That's really sure. awesome. Yeah. I, well, I'll be curious to see what happens with Episode 7. I know nothing about that either, so I will be learning, you know, as as you will, sort of what where this is all heading. I'm not sure exactly whether or not Rebels will impact them or, you know, that, that'll also be, it, it's just the whole world is just bristling with excitement right now, anticipation and, um, yeah, I can't wait to read or watch Episode 7, read the book and watch Episode 7. That is so exciting. Well, Vanessa, we are so grateful that you came on and gave us a little insight into your time at Star Wars Weekends and then also Rebels. So we appreciate your time very much. Thanks so much. And uh, I think Taylor is coming down. You guys get to meet Ezra next. So he's he's a great kid. You're, you'll You'll like him a lot. We we are very excited. I'm looking forward to Teresa's Instagrams and Twitters and reports. Me too. So. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I'll do a better job this coming weekend than I did last weekend. It, last weekend was kind of hard. There was a billion people in town, um, and this oh, weekend is going to be too? me. I heard it was it was very hot. It was it was not like the weekend when you were here. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> But people said, like, don't get used to this because this is very rare. It was lovely. I, I enjoyed the weather. Yes, it was brutal the second weekend, but it, um, I didn't notice. It was it was too much fun. You didn't really notice. Just kept drinking water. And, there you go. And it was great. <laughs> so, again, thank you. Well, thank you, guys. I love you, and I just think you're awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. So, high five and a total flail. <laughs> Yay. <Woo. laughs> All right. Take care. Okay, bye. So we wanted to thank Vanessa for coming on the show, being super supportive of fans, especially fangirls, and really reaching out to fans through Twitter and Instagram and all of that kind of stuff. She's she's an amazing new addition to the fan community, wouldn't you say, Tricia? Yes, I think that was going to go down in as an epic interview. And it's so nice to be able to communicate with fans. You know, Vanessa talked about that, and that was the same way when I was young. You just didn't know a lot of people that were fellow fans. And I'm going into withdrawal, talking about Star Wars. And it was so great week one. And to see Ashley Eckstein up there with her and behind the force. And um, do you have Tia Sarkar on speed dial? No, I wish I did. And we should probably spread out our VIP appearances on the show a little bit. But I might have someone that we can talk to. So, Bethany Blanton, are you there? Hello, hello. I am here indeed. It is great to be talking to both of you again. I'm definitely feeling fangirl and fandom withdrawal in general after seeing everyone's photos from the last Star Wars weekends in which I missed Mark Hamill and hanging out with all of you guys. But at least Riley got to go. So, <laughs> Well, Bethany was on, Teresa and I have the fangirl chat, and Bethany was on along with Sarah from Skywalking Through Neverland, and we talked all about our week two experience, the Rebel Force Radio meetup, getting to meet all of our fans and friends and Bethany was there with her brother Riley and they're both from the Star Wars report and this was your first Disney experience too Um, but we didn't get to talk much in all that chatting about Rebels preview we talked about the experience so we kind of wanted to talk tonight about Sabine this other great female character and the whole video from the behind the force so what did you guys think Epic! Indeed, yes. I've got one word. Heard, <laughs> yes. I'm, let, let me expand upon that. I'm now excited. So I'm like all excited and jittery and everything. I move way too much when I podcast, but that's what happens. Anyway, but I love that scene because, first of all, I am a fan of Mandalorians in general. Uh, it's not just the shiny armor, though I'll admit that's part of it, and hers is pretty cool. But uh, to see a female character who is not a Jedi, but who can still really kick butt, who is seems to be very confident in herself and really has her own personality. You know, she's she's 
does not seem to be drawing on the personality of others. And I like that she's not reliant on others. Um, so I really like seeing that clip with her. Just there was so much personality just packed into the one small clip that we saw. That was really the part that I was excited about was I felt like I knew the character instantly because she came across the screen, the screen so, so strongly. She really did. And, you know, the thing for me, even with the clip that sort of solidified me loving Sabine was actually the Disney character that they have in the parades and or in the parade motorcade and in the show, because that's the first real look that anybody has gotten at the character outside of the small clips that we've had. And Mm -hmm. if she's going to be anything the way she was portrayed in the motorcade, it's going to be amazing. So much sass and spunk. And I was at the motorcade at one point when somebody said, I love your hair. And her simple response was to put her hands on her head and like kind of, you know, combing her hair sort of, and then going, I know. Right. And then walking away. (laughs) <laughs> that was fantastic. She, um, in the scene, that the clip we saw, you know, she was uh, kind of doing a little operation. Uh, she was the distraction against some stormtroopers. And the stormtroopers were very, a New Hope stormtroopers, they maybe weren't the best shots. But she was definitely giving them, you know, a little test there, uh, evading. And there was a lot of witty um, Leia-type dialogue and that she was really letting the zingers fly. And, um, you know, she was doing her little test tag and we saw some tie fighters and she's you know had forgotten something and she went back and at the end when you see the diversion the little explosion that she set off it was full of color so um and in that scene we didn't see anybody actually hurt which was a very interesting angle on it she wasn't there to kill or maim anybody she was just there to divert people to divert attention and put her own little flair on it when she did it so um, it wasn't like she's trying to hide who she is she definitely wants you know the people there were people acknowledging her she walked away it looked like the people of the town um, you know kind of being congratulatory so it's not like they're necessarily you know this little band is hidden from view but i just like that sort of confidence that she walked away even from um doing her job yeah and you know i really liked just the personality of her character and the way that she sort of showed her youth but also maturity at the same time and Mm -hmm. i don't know there was just something about her that made me really want to learn more about her and it got to me in a way that um the oh Hera clip in a completely different way from the Hera clip because this one was pretty much just Sabine by herself um and I thought that was nice I kind of wish that the Hera clip had been just her on her own rather than her interacting with Kanan and Chopper Mm mm-hmm yeah, this definitely this was definitely a, a a character statement piece, and that might just be the way the story is or what they have done so far. So, um, but it was definitely you know, we there's a little bit of Hera dialogue from the ship. You don't even see her in the scene, but you know we definitely get a statement of, and that's one of the things I loved about Star Wars, kind of being intrigued enough by a character that you just want to know more. So that's the way I left that that showing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Kind of got it. I hope kind of the character excited. doesn't die like in the first season. <laughs> 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 I'm already just like, oh, oh no, I knew. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, after all the speculation with Ahsoka going throughout the whole of the Clone Wars series, then but doesn't that give you like, more, more faith that Dave Filoni was, you know that that was what we thought was going to happen and he protected those characters so i feel like she's going to be okay thank you thank you my my heart rate has gone back down now (laughs) well and bethany as someone who has been pretty skeptical of um rebels how did seeing the clip help you at all in your viewpoint the clip really helped me because in in part, I, I was a little skeptical, but that 
that's not entirely the way I would describe my feelings prior. It was more just a, a lack of excitement, a, a feeling that, oh, you know, I don't really feel like I know this show. I don't really feel like, you know, I, I don't know the characters on it. So I don't know, you know, I'm excited about a new Star Wars show and it has a lot of the Clone Wars crew and that's really exciting, but I don't really know anything about it. And I was sad about the Clone Wars ending. So I was just kind of like, uh, you know, I, uh, it'll probably be good when it comes out. But, man, I feel bummed about the Clone Wars. <laughs> but this show, I mean, these clips helped me see the show as, oh, this is going to be an exciting and fun show. And it looks like it'll have characters that I like. And uh, it, it really, it made the show real for me. I feel excited about it now, and I, I want to follow the news about it more closely. And the characters really intrigue me. And the animation, I really like the animation. It's not the same as The Clone Wars, but I do like it. Yeah, It's definitely a different style, but I think just as beautiful in its own kind of unique way. Mm-hmm. So, um, Teresa, you got to see another clip that Bethany and I didn't get to see with Ezra Bridger. So do you want to tell us about that? I did. I can't believe it's it's so weird because I feel like when I saw you guys last was not that long ago, but it's actually been two weekends now. Um, yes, the Ezra Bridger scene is really cool. Um, but the thing is, is, like, I don't want to spoil it for people because we got told to put away your cell phones. Put away well, your you video camera. You don't have to spoil I'm it. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> you can spoil it, but people, you can turn it off for like five minutes and then, no, turn it back on. No, it was, so what, but did you, were you as intrigued by the character? Did you get the same kind of great vibe off of him? So to start off, I was pretty skeptical about Ezra. Out of all of the characters, I wasn't sure if I was really going to like him as a character. And then after seeing this scene, I'm excited for him. Um, again, it was a scene that was just him solo by himself. And similar to the Sabine scene that we saw in Weekend 2. And it explains a little bit about the kind of things that he's doing maybe prior to joining the group on the ghost. And he's he's kind of just a little thief and a little con artist. And it's... It's sort of cool to see that, um, and he's obviously very good at what he does. He he has a great little attitude about him, and one of the coolest things is we get to see a TIE fighter pilot take his helmet off, and so we get to see what that TIE fighter pilot looks like underneath the helmet, which we never get to see in the films, obviously, and I was half expecting to see a, you know, a Django Fett clone, but it was not a Django Fett clone. <laughs> So that was kind of cool. And just the dynamic between Ezra and the TIE fighter pilot was was really, really cool. So I'm excited for it. And um, I love the fact that Ezra is kind of a little bit of a con artist. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how he interacts with the people on the ghost. Hmm. I'm excited. I'm excited to see, um, you know, a Jedi have to deal with a little someone who's a little bit of a bad boy. So obviously we sort of that we sort of saw that dynamic with Anakin and Obi Wan. Although you know I don't think Anakin had was always you know kind of trying to save people and help people. So he's a little bit different in that way. But um, you know I'm 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 bummed I missed it. I've I've read stuff about it, so I'm I'll be really excited when the show comes out and we get to see it. Yeah, I think one of the things about Ezra that's cool is it's sort of like you know he doesn't know, kind of like Luke. He doesn't know what the Force is. He doesn't know that he's in tune with the Force. He doesn't know that some of the things that he can do, sort of like Harry Potter. That oh wait, Trisha doesn't know anything about Harry Potter, and Bethany, Oops. you've seen like. One of them or something. Right? You're, no, you're talking. We actually, uh, Riley and I did a whole Harry Potter marathon uh, last summer and watched all of the Harry Potter films. Oh, so. good girl. Good girl. Okay, so like in the first Harry Potter where Harry doesn't know how he makes the glass disappear and he doesn't know how he does stuff that he ends up doing when he gets mad or sad or emotional. It's sort of the same way with Ezra. He just sort of does things and he's being assisted by the force, but he doesn't really know he's being assisted by the force. 
So I think that's really cool. That is makes pretty neat. Exciting. It's it's interesting to think of a a world without the Jedi, but you are force sensitive and what that might be like as a child when you haven't really figured out that other people can't do this yet. <laughs> And then you sort of grow into a slow awareness of this is unusual. This is really different, you know. Yeah. When you realize you are no longer a muggle. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, no Harry Potter references. I don't understand. No. <laughs> I saw the movies. I just don't remember what all those terms are. <laughs> oh, my, Trisha. Come on. <sighs> I know. I was sort of watching lazily, you know, just I need to watch these movies. I don't understand. For someone who is as into the kind of things that you are into, like, you would love Harry Potter. I was being a rebel. Uh, that's that's what it was. Ah, okay. I made it funny. So, um, but that but. just went Ninja Turtle. Like, <laughs> what is happening? Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay, yeah, that did. But so e Ezra Bridger is sort of like the Luke Skywalker in a way, in that he doesn't know a lot about what he's capable of, and we, we're going to get to grow with him a little bit. And I think there was some guy named Mark Hamill or some actor there this past weekend that maybe Teresa saw too. <laughs> I, yes, I did. I got to see two of the three shows. I didn't go on Sunday because I was so tired. Um, but he was, how can I say, phenomenal. Um, I didn't know that Mark Hamill had as big of a personality as he actually does. I honestly, I really did not know that. Um, and... Trisha knows this. Bethany, I think you do, too, that, like, I like the original trilogy, of course, but the prequel trilogy is kind of, like, where my heart sort of lies. And I identified more with, like, Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan and Darth Maul and Padme and all those characters a little bit more than I identified with the original trilogy characters, minus Boba Fett and Lando. Um, mm -hmm. So Mark Hamill, just in the first show I saw on Friday, I suddenly was like, Luke Skywalker is cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but goodness. I had to wait until 2014 in order to, <laughs> to see him when he's, you know, however old he is, um, you know, to see him in person to really go, wow. And I just thought it was so cool. And he was sporting a beard. And that's because he can't shave because he has to have a beard for some independent film he's filming here soon somewhere in a country that speaks English but not the same. Um, and uh, apparently it takes him forever to grow a beard. And the beard that he has was not a very full beard. It's kind of a sort of sad beard. He even said so himself. And that's six weeks of him growing a beard. So the poor guy um, does not grow a beard well. We well, it. they have costume people for that, makeup, whatnot. <laughs> did did you, Bethany, did you get to see the video that's been posted of the show? Have you seen any of it? I haven't seen the full show, but I've seen a few clips. And he is really looking fit. He's, he's looking a whole lot more like some of the uh, photos on some of the books of an older Luke Skywalker, which is really, really interesting to me. Um, but... It's pretty exciting. It makes Act 7 feel that much more real. And he seems to be fit and, and excited about things. I mean, uh, Teresa, you saw him. Would you say that he seemed pretty uh, out there and excited about Star Wars? Or Oh, definitely. He's very excited about Star Wars. There were There's a couple of things that come to mind, um, to my memory, when I think about the shows. He, in both the shows I saw, he made a point to talk about how secretive they're being about things regarding Star Wars. And he says that they're not trying to be mean. They're not trying to keep stuff from us. They're not trying to, you know, be 
super secretive and all this kind of stuff. What they're trying to do is preserve our movie experience for when we go to the movie theater to experience Star Wars the way it's meant to be experienced at the movie theater and not on the Internet. And I started a huge clap for that um, both times that I saw him at the show because I am not a spoiler person. I am not a speculator. I don't like to sit here and go, oh, well, what if this happens or what if this person is cast as this person? I want to wait and find out and let them tell me, you know, and so I loved that he said that and I love that he addressed it and made sure to say something about it. I thought it was just super. It, he's well, he got the talking points. So if you if you if you he's heard any of the actors that have talked that are on the cast, they say almost exactly the same thing. So that's mm-hmm. that's the line they were told to get. To get or we can just pretend that. that he did that because that's how he really feels, Trisha. Well, no, I I <laughs> I think he does. Um, it, it, what was obvious from the, from the Celebration Europe pictures is our first fangirl chat was after Celebration Europe. Do you remember that? And was, so everybody was thinking we'd get the news that the cast was, you know, the old actors are coming back. And Mark looked kind of, you know, in those pictures, kind of sad puppy face. And um, he was full on, I, you know, seen the um, footage on Inside the Magic because they put it up so fast. They must have gone like left the park and loaded it up. But that's fine with me. Well, um, Ricky he just, was there. He was sitting a few rows in front of me. Ricky Brigante. Yeah, he, so he he just seemed so excited um, to be kind of, you know, remember he's he was a comic book fan. Um, you know, when he was talking about uh, knowing who the voice actors were on cartoons and whatnot, he's a fan of things himself. So I think he understands and he's trying, I think that's what he was trying to do is talk to um, everybody and relate how, you know, I, nobody's trying to taunt you or be mean. Um, although I have to say that this past week, JJ Abrams did the best, you know, um, little, you know, wink, wink, poke, poke oh, back at the, <laughs> at the fans with this little note um, about, you know, pictures being leaked and the Falcon is not in the in uh, the movie. So, you know, they're I think, you know, they're they're going to be respectful that fans like to see things. And at the same time, if you want to go out and find things, you can. And if you, and but they're not going to go out there and force feed it. Like they're not going to show us the movie in the trailer. Which is isn't that the point? Mark Hamill made is he doesn't want to go to a, a movie and see the trailer and uh, you know for the next movie and already know what the next movie's about. So he said yeah, something then, like that. Uh, you know, it's funny as I just remembered. I could basically tell you what the whole show on Saturday was since I live tweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, and that was the good thing that she did. She did live tweet it. So, um, so uh, Bethany, were were you a fan like of Mark Hamill, uh, or it, you know, were you a fan of Mark Hamill? Just you know, be, ha- having you know, because you're young. You know, for me, he was like you know, I had posters of him on the wall when I was a kid. So, um, I, you know, I was I was you know young I was a teenager when he was you know Empire Strikes Back I was 13 and so were you a fan of him before that before knowing about episode seven or is it just or are you starting to get to know him as an actor um I I was a fan of him just from the Star Wars movies I'm not sure I've really seen him in much if anything else really uh so I liked him from the original trilogy but outside of that, and, and just following him because I'm a Star Wars fan, I don't really know that much about him. You know, I, I didn't follow the stuff that he did prior to Star Wars, really. So I would have to say kind of, yeah, not really. But Luke is one of my favorite characters uh, from Star Wars. So that that does show that Mark Hamill definitely had an effect. But uh, I guess... Something that I was just going to mention real quick is, yes, that those, the things that Mark said about the, essentially about spoilers and leaks and whatnot, and about giving us too much information, even though they were probably talking points given to everybody, to me, that is actually a good thing because it shows that everyone on the production side of things 
is basically on the same page. And I, if if JJ and the whole crew of Episode Seven, if they can manage to strike a balance between, you know, I don't want to know every single thing about the movie either before I go into the movie itself. If they can strike a balance between making the movie a nice surprise, but also making fans feel, hey, you're not just being ignored or, you know, we wish you didn't exist before the movie so that we didn't have to worry about publicity. You know, uh, if, if, if they can strike a balance between those two kind of extremes, that would be nice. Yeah, and I think that's probably what, you know, some of the social media uh interaction i know for the avengers a lot of the actors for avengers 2 do a lot of social media and we're starting to see that with um you know daisy ridley and john boyega doing some tweeting the fun the wildest speculation i saw it was kind of funny and it's and it's so far out there that you know it's just but um harrison ford and jj abrams and oscar isaac were in a picture that the tabloids the daily mail got over in england from this week and they were just out walking on the street and uh, instantly someone put up speculation that oscar isaac must be harrison harrison ford's son in the movie which i thought was like how is them walking down the street with jj abrams when they're just out doing their thing have anything to do with all of a sudden putting them and they're not even on the set so i just thought it was kind of a funny you know that's how crazy people get about their speculations i was like wow i mean that that's a stretch it's not even a picture of them on the set together i have a feeling i'm going to be ignoring most of my twitter feed for like the next however long until December, because I just don't care about people and their stupidness. <laughs> sorry. I'm well, sorry. You know, I, I, I like to speculate, but just for the fun of it to be, ooh, oh, what if this happened or what if that happened? Or what might, yeah. Because I know 90% of what I'm saying is because I know, but I like to think of all the different possibilities because I know that that is what JJ and what the script writers and what the actors are all thinking is you know all the different directions that they could take this and the thing that makes me happy is I'm glad that I'm not the script writer for episode 7 because frankly I don't have that kind of talent so but I like a few good ideas and what I can think of <gasps> what if they make the Brienne of Tarth person this kind of character what if she's a Jedi or what if she's a Sith or what if she's this or that or the other I know that Whatever I'm thinking will be trumped by the movie itself. And so I can get excited by just thinking through all the different possibilities. Then uh, that to me is something fun that I can do as a fan without saying, oh, J.J. was seen with this person. Therefore, this person is really likely going to be blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, I'm, I just stretching. <laughs> Just to, to show the other side a little bit, Teresa, of the the speculating coin, I met most of my Star Wars fan friends in fanfic, and a lot of those people were writing speculative fiction, and that's how for that was then between episode two and three. So most of my really good friends, that's how we met. We had fun kind of devising and imagining and reading and saying, oh, what would they do? So, you know, it's just... It to each their own how how they want to enjoy it. Some people re- that's what they really like to do is speculate, and other people don't want to know. So I, you know, I just let it be how they like to be. You have a really good point there because just not thinking about it, uh, when Riley and I were quite small, quite young, uh, my dad mostly, but my sister as well, would always tell us stories. And it was years later when we would read books watch movies that we realized that some of the stories they told us were essentially alternate realities to movies like Star Wars or the Lord of the Rings books uh, or the Hobbit book. And my dad and my sister would tell us that some stories that they, they created originally for us and sometimes they'd read to us, sometimes they'd essentially just tell us fan fiction, but there wasn't a word for it for them. Uh, so I think I may have stumbled upon the reason why speculation for me is fun is because that's something that uh, I've kind of done through my life is what would have happened if, you know, Leia had been the one trained by Obi-Wan or what would have been the case if this had happened or that had happened? I suppose that's the secret fan fiction loving Bethany. 
goodness. I didn't realize <laughs> he that. Didn't even know, he didn't even know it. No. Well, I think what's so funny is, like, how you two, y'all could get, like, super excited about that. And, like, for me, I would just be like, I'm going to play a game on my phone now. Because, <laughs> like, I am a mu- movie purist kind of person in the sense of I don't want to know I don't want to think about it. I don't want to try to, you know, try to figure out what's going to happen or whatever. I'm even like that with books. I don't, I don't want to do that. I want the author or the director or the script writer, whatever. I want them to tell me, you know, and that's, so that's just how I come from it. Like I have no interest in trying to figure out who Daisy Ridley's playing. I don't want to know. I want to watch the movie have them tell me and have me be able to feel it from the screen. Well, and, and that's, um, I think that's what's great about uh, Star Wars is you can co- pretty much come at it any way you want to. So, but yeah, Twitter may be dangerous if you don't want real spoilers, but um, it, in the future, I'm kind of like, I, I wish people wouldn't put, they were, they've been putting like Twitter, like the spoiler picks that have leaked, they're twit picking them. And I wish they wouldn't do that. You know, I wish if they say, Oh, I found pictures or I talked about it here, but not put the pictures as a twit pick. Cause that really, I mean, then the, then that's just kind of like, you have no choice. You're just like all the sense on your Twitter feed mm-hmm. and, you know, and that's what, mm-hmm. that's a little bit, but it, the talking about, the social media and getting people excited without spoiling them. I, John Boyega and Daisy Ridley and Daisy Ridley's finally been confirmed on Twitter that it is it's, she's been verified and she tweeted she was excited. Yeah. So she's at Ridley underscore Daisy and John Boyega is J Boyega on Twitter and they've been having fun. And, um, you know, John Boyega started with the picture of himself, riding out in the in the desert to a set with on a camel and there was a woman with him and then finally um we got that confirmed um and so they've been you know having some fun just sharing the experience of making the movie which we'll probably all see in a book the making of uh episode seven whatever it's called but Teresa, um daisy ridley's first tweet was something um that we've about a subject that we've talked about on Fangirls Going Rogue. She tweeted about how we used how they used to market to girls more gender neutral, an old, old picture of um, it was a Lego ad that had a little girl on it. And that was her first Twitter um, picture. So I thought that was kind of interesting for her first retweet. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of nice to see that. Um I started following all these people sort of late in the game, so I missed a lot of their stuff. And to be honest, yeah, I'm paying more attention to Instagram than I am to Twitter these days. So I had to find them all on Instagram. I finally did. Um, and, by the way, since I'm discussing Instagram, Mark Hamill just joined Instagram as of, I think, Sunday. And he's at Hamill Ooh. himself. So he already has, like, over some ridiculous amount of followers. But um, And... and- and didn't he have a cool tweet too? That did I see it in your retweets that Star Wars needs more girls? Oh, that I'm not sure, but I'll scroll through my my tweets because I have it right I, now I, in front of I'm me. I'm pretty sure. Sh- I'm pretty sure he he tweeted something like that. But the thing that got me uh, really excited from all you know, just following around on Twitter and, and paying attention was. Um, you know, just that their their enthusiasm for um, what's going on, and that sort of helps. You know, at least feel like you're a part of it, especially for people who want to know more. And there was um, this act, the stunt actress Chloe Bruce, who's been in. She stunted in Guardians of the Galaxy. She's been in Thor, and there was a video of her doing her action uh, stunt sequence. And this this young lady is like uh, Ray Park female Ray Park and I they nobody knows she was there in Abu Dhabi at the same time her and another another stunt actor and let me tell you that more than anything nothing that I that got me excited because I'm like if there is a character a female character who's like Ray Park I don't care who it is I don't it it doesn't matter to me but if there's somebody (laughs) who can do stunts like that that we could have that's my favorite moment in Star Wars was seeing the whole duel of the fates and the Phantom Menace with, uh, you know, when, when all of a sudden you see Darth Maul that flipping and whipping. Yes. 
So I see this video of Chloe Bruce doing her, um, you know, her tricks and her flips, and she's got the um, the staffs and the martial arts weapons, and I'm now I'm like totally just really excited about what's going on. And then then we get more news from Kathleen Kennedy that we have two more ladies, actresses, phenomenal actresses that are going to be in Star Wars. And that's Lupita Nyong'o and Gwendolyn Christie. And that that double whammy, I think that was a good way to do it rather than, you know, we knew that there was more casting announcements coming, but that really, I think, kind of nailed home for, there were, you know, there's been a lot of talk about concerns about the cat original casting announcement. And Lupita and Gwendolyn Christie really made me feel a lot more confident about the movie. So what did you guys think? Um, well, you know, you and I don't have the same opinion on the female cast in the movie. Because to me, I didn't really care. And I know I didn't really care but you did, and so I'm glad that this got announced for you, because when I saw it, I was like, Trisha's going to be so happy. <laughs> um, and for me, I was like, this is really cool, but it wasn't, you know, something that I was, you know, really attached to. But I was very happy for you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You know, Lapita was, um, you know, she was, she won an Oscar this year. And then she was also the fifth in the people's 50 most beautiful person. And, um, and she's, she's so intelligent and smart. Um, I, you can't, you know, she's lived around the world. She's born in Mexico and, you know, and then here she is talking about that when she grew up that she just felt like she wasn't in this article that she wasn't, um, you know, an attractive person. She felt that everybody was supposed to be long blonde with long flowing hair. The, that was what, um, what beauty beauty was. And now she's here representing and realizing that, that she can be a different type of beautiful and represent that to other people. And so I think it's great to see someone with such great positive body image. It reminds me a lot of Jennifer Lawrence and the way she's approached. Um, you know, a lot of people went, went after Jennifer Lawrence very early on because she wasn't a certain body type for the Hunger Games and whatnot. And she's had a great kind of um, been a role model. And I think it's great to see these actresses that have um, this type of, um, you know, personal self-confidence and self-esteem. And I know, Bethany, you you have seen Gwendolyn Christie in uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 to me, it's very interesting, too, because a lot of the actors announced for episode 7 are, they don't have, I mean, aside from the original characters, obviously, don't have really massive um, filmographies. Uh, so, like, Gwendolyn Christie has nine filmography credits for Star Wars, The Hunger Games, uh, Mockingjay Part 1 and 2, Game of Thrones, and then another TV show and a couple of other things, including The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Or I have no idea how you pronounce that. <laughs> uh, but uh, And I probably just butchered it. <laughs> but uh, she she is interesting to me because um, she is a six-foot-three actress who uh, lives in London and she's most well known for Game of Thrones like Trisha mentioned and to me having seen her her acting style seems to be rather rigid in some ways I know that that's her character as well but uh, she has a very strong sense of honor and she's an upstanding and very courageous character in Game of Thrones and uh, to me, I'm quite fascinated to see what type of a person she might play because, uh, well, partly because of her height, but also because her acting style is so strong in Game of Thrones uh, and so overpowering in style that to me, it seems like she will be someone who, if 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 we, she is a stereotyped character, which you know, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it would be very interesting to see what type of a character that that could wind up being. Because uh, someone with 
Like, you kind of expect to see Leia's personality type at some point in one of these characters. She has that strength, but it's it's more of an overpowering strength uh, because she has a very physical as well as a very personal presence when she's on screen. Uh, she is the character that you're looking at um, and, and watching carefully. Well, I she's she's uh, at least six inches taller than Mark Hamill, so she's definitely a tall, <laughs> tall woman, <laughs> and Gwendolyn is. So I'm excited to see. Uh, but Gwendolyn has also spoke out. Um, she's supported um, fictional uh, uh, program in England that uh, uh, supports uh, women storytellers. So they all picked a book by a woman storyteller and then like um, tweeted about it and did like a can there was a campaign to support that. So, you know, she's actively, um, you know, again, another voice that speaks out for women and um, in storytelling. So I like to see that too. So, you know, we've got, we've, we've got between Carrie Fisher um, Daisy Ridley, Lupita Nyong'o, and Gwendolyn Christie, we have some very strong female uh, personalities of, in their own rights. And so I think, the, you know, Mark Hamill talked about that in his little thing that they kind of type, uh, uh, you know, they sort of cast a type and not necessarily that they're getting cast a type, but that those that they have that in them already, that strong, um, you know, presence that will kind of shine for, forth on the screen. Have either of you seen um, 12 Years a Slave? Yes. Okay. What did you think of Lupita in that? Because I actually haven't seen that yet. Uh, you know, it's it was a it was a tough, tough gritty role, and um, the whole movie's kind of overwhelming in that it's something that you should know about and not forget. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's there, there's nothing. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of um, tragedy in that movie, and she carried it off very well. You know, she she was just you know it was a heart. It was they. I think she said when she got cast, she went into audition. They actually told her she was too pretty, and she had you know at first, which I thought was an interesting comment. So, um, but you know, she definitely pulled off the the character, and um, the the movie is is great and powerful. It's one of those things you need to see, but. There, it's hard to watch. You have to be in the right mood. Like mm-hmm. Passion of the Christ. Or, um, oh, whatever the 9-11 movie is with Nicolas Cage. I forget what oh, it's yeah. called. There's yeah. certain movies that I just, like, I saw them once and they sit there. And every now and then I think that'd be good to watch. And then I go, why? And exactly. I just stress myself out. So I, you know, it's interesting because the the thing that this sort of one of the reasons I think for a lot of women that the the casting news was and was concerning was because we really just didn't know anything about Daisy Ridley and we obviously knew Carrie Fisher was going to be in there but there's you know that that leaves very little room when you when you look and you have to you know put your hopes and dreams on on one young character or actress that you don't know anything about. And I think that really was hard for people. Um, Lupita brings um, with her, you know, a big golden statue, not that that makes anybody awesome, but um, in the, in the next role, but it does help, I think to, to, for people to feel comfortable. And then, you know, Gwendolyn Christie has a, you know, I think she's going to be the rock star of 2015 because she's going to be in Game of Thrones, Hunger Games, and in Star Wars. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. Yeah, but her role in Hunger, in, yeah, in Mockingjay Part 2 isn't, um, I mean, it's not like a, it's a supporting role, so. Yeah, but she's still going to be doing, she's still going to be doing press. And just imagine every time she sits down to do press for the Hunger Games, they're going to ask her about Star Wars. So. Probably. <laughs> well, and like I said, it. her character in Game of Thrones is most definitely a supporting character. And yet, when she's on screen, she tends to be the character that you're paying the most attention to. Yeah, I can uh, see that. for me. But, uh... I wonder how closely Mockingjay films will stick to book. <laughs> that sounds like a good fangirl chat um, topic. <laughs> Although probably not one I will join because, again, speculation. Um, 
so gay. <laughs> I'm just, it's so funny. It's like I can feel myself getting into this mode as things are starting to come out that I like to where I'm starting to distance myself from social media because I'm like, Mockingjay is coming. You know, all this stuff is coming. No internet. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it, you know, it happens every now and then when there's a big film coming out where I, where I just kind of like go into dark mode where I stop paying attention because I get scared that somebody's going to say something. Yeah. Well, I don't think I'll, I don't. That's the thing, though. At least in the in in like Twitter, you can't. They can't give you the plot away. I hope, man. If it was a one word plot point. Well, they can say so and so dies, and then it's like, ah, true. Why did you do that to me? And actually, Teresa, uh, just for clarification for me, I do like speculating. I do not like actual spoilers that might make me too picky of a person and a little weird. I love to speculate (laughs) as long as I don't know what I'm speculating about. Here's there you go. Here's the thing. I'm afraid that it's going to come across as speculation and then it's really going to end up being a spoiler, you know? So I read it all in fun that people are like, Oh, this is blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it becomes true. And then it's like, it, you know, it sits in my brain as something that I've read. And then I'm like, dang. Happening in the movie, you realize what's happening. Yeah. And that's yeah. just no fun for anyone exactly. in my well, head. What I actually brought up the Mockingjay thing was, I'm I'm curious to see if uh, Christie's character uh, winds up having more screen time than that character. I believe it's Commander Lime did yeah. in the book. Mm. Li- so, likely they're going to show more of the war. That we're not going to see it just from Katniss's point of view. But um, I but even though I mean there's still there's so there's actually such a huge cast for that. So it'll be. It'll be neat to see all of them. So, spoiler warning: If anybody likes the Hunger Games and you haven't read Mockingjay, <laughs> <laughs> so Bethany, do you have time to talk our character talk, or do you have to get going? I do. Yes, mm-hmm. you do have time. Okay, great, perfect. Well. I brought up what I wanted our character discussion to be, and it's not so much of a character in and of itself as it is sort of a group of characters. And then we can kind of, however we decide to talk about them, we'll let the conversation just flow. But we wanted to talk about the Jedi Order. And I don't know, I mean, my idea was to talk about the Jedi Order during the prequels, um, because there really Mm -hmm. isn't a Jedi Order in... The original trilogy. So more of like the Jedi Council and the state of the Jedi Order during the prequel trilogy. And um, I guess how we can start this would be, we can just go around, but initial thoughts. You have no idea how excited I am to talk about this. (laughs) Initial (laughs) thoughts on the Jedi Council and the Jedi Order from the prequel trilogy and keep it to like two sentences. Trisha. (laughs) I think that the Jedi Order ended up in the prequel trilogies not being what you imagined if your first experience was learning about them through Obi-Wan's telling in the original trilogy. So you ended up seeing a little bit more of the truth um, and a mirror held up to him and they weren't maybe as magical and uh, full of honor that I might have believed when I was 10 years old. And Bethany? Bethany? For me, the Jedi Order and the Jedi Council during the prequel trilogy, uh, watching that unfold was watching that order slowly stray from what it was designed to do and what its purpose was, and in that straying, let themselves be torn apart. And for me, I feel like the Jedi Order and the Jedi Council had very big choices to make and I feel like they made choices not based on what the Jedi Order would do but on what they thought would be politically acceptable to keep them in the public eyes good graces um I also feel like the Jedi Order um specifically the council in this instance um lost sight of its loyalty to its own members, i.e. Ahsoka Tano Clone Wars, Season 5. Mm-hmm. Has, has everybody seen the Lost Missions? Yes. yes. 
Well, I think the really, I talked about this when I did the round table with, um, with Eric Geller was just that the Yoda sort of embodies this moment where you realize that the Jedi order is almost attached to an ideal of who they're supposed to be. And during the war, you see, you know, they're, they're worried so much about the prophecy and about the rules and about, you know, everything that they've learned and all these, the structure they've established over all these centuries to build this order that protects peace and the guardians of the galaxy, Oh wow! Now I have a <laughs> Guardians of the Hulk. Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but oh, they, goodness. you know, they were so attached to the idea of themselves that they stopped being. At some point, Jedi didn't have rules; they just had to do what they thought was right. And really, what that happens in the Yoda arc is he realizes that he has to do what he thinks is right, not necessarily, you know, the what the order. Um, you know, thinks of him as being maybe he's going off the deep end. He doesn't know about um, the things that we had started to learn about. You know, Qui-Gon was the same way. And, you know, Obi-Wan says, you're, um, you know, you're too much of a rebel. That's why you're not on the council. So and it's ended up being Qui-Gon and Yoda who become kind of these shepherds into the, you know, into Luke's uh Jedi training and they don't train him the way they trained everybody else. So I think it's, it's interesting. So when Teresa brought up them as a character, I was like, I, I love this because the Jedi council as a, as a being in star Wars, much like we talked about the millennium Falcon as a character in star Wars, the Jedi council definitely undergoes this sort of um, cleansing and um, getting torn down and rebuilt up, which is what you do with, that's what a hero's journey is in a way. And so are we seeing maybe in the sequel trilogy, um, a sort of bit tearing down and building back up into something better. So I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, Teresa's like, Oh man, I didn't know she was going to go there. This is getting fun. I'm going to just be like, and where did Teresa go on the podcast? <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the specific members of the Jedi Council, just because I feel like there are some of them that don't get enough time, don't get enough say, or maybe some that have too much. And specifically, the first one I want to talk about is Mace Windu. And <laughs> there's a reason for this, because I was, I was okay. all about Mace Windu when during the prequel trilogy, and I was like, purple lightsaber, Samuel L. Jackson, attitude, don't wet, mess with me, awesome. <laughs> and then suddenly he became this person where I was like, I cannot believe you right now. I don't understand what you're doing. I don't like you. How could you turn on somebody who has, you know, done everything that you asked of them and I don't get it, and I don't like you anymore. And suddenly I was not sad when he died. So I've gone through a very tragic, you know, feelings on Mace Windu. So I would love to hear how you guys feel. Hmm. I, you know, I'm I'm not a Mace Windu fan. And I've talked about that on Assembly of Geeks. They give me so much grief about it. And it, and it's, it's funny because I love... I love the purple lightsaber, actually, but Mace Windu sort of epitomizes what the Jedi were, which do, which is don't get attached to things, right? And so him sort of not understanding where Anakin was coming from or even Qui-Gon, he was never letting his attachments help shape his decisions. He was never just believing in people. He was, you know, believing in the kind of system um, and, you know, so in the movies, I never really liked Mace Windu, so it didn't change for me. It didn't surprise me what he did because he was so clinical and kind of cold. And um, I actually liked Mace Windu better in Matt Stover's books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked him better in the novels. Mm, actually, you ha kind of have a point there. But um, for me, Mace Windu was the perfect Jedi from Mace Windu's perspective. If that makes sense. You know, he he never had any problems with his emotions. He he always had good judgment in the sense of he was calculating and he was he always thought strategically, not from a compassionate perspective or from an emotional perspective. Which made him a great warrior and a great uh second in command 
but Mace Windu, there, there's a part of his personality, the part that clashed the most with Anakin, because he had very little understanding or compassion. So his first response to dealing with the character of Anakin was, Anakin is straying, therefore we can't trust him, we shouldn't trust him, you know, we need to do something about him, instead of, what can we do to actually help Anakin? Which is more what Yoda tried to do and what Obi-Wan tried to do. Um, I feel like Yoda, especially if you watch the Lost Missions arc, and especially the arc with Yoda in it, Yoda was more open to, I guess, the living force. He was more open to learning what it was that Qui-Gon seemed to learn, which is the Jedi are straying, and Mace Windu seemed to kind of lead down that straying path, charging full speed ahead. Yeah, I, I like you know, I, I like the resilience of Mace Windu's character. Honestly, I do like that. But he he and he, he started to see. I mean, he was intelligent enough to start to see that this war is doing something to the Jedi. So he wasn't completely blind. But I I just feel like the character had very little compassion. He was so devoted to teachings and to the order and to strategy that he would see people more as pieces in a puzzle. Have either of you read Shatterpoint? Yes. No. So if Mace Windu's gift, shall we say, it's been years since I read that, so correct me if I'm wrong, but if he can see people... And he can he can sense the future and see portions of, of different people's futures because he sees them like almost like a puzzle. And Shatterpoint represents that word represents where he can see a point in someone's future where the lines are connecting for him. And all of a sudden he has an intuition about something. And to me, that's the way that he sees people as part of a puzzle. Not as individuals, not ever. He didn't, as he didn't do a very good job at the there in Revenge of the Sith, did he? No, no, he didn't. And I think that's because he was looking at the picture that Palpatine was spinning, and yep. not at the people who were involved. And that's why I think that Mace Windu is not a very good Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so guilty when he went out the window because I was like, yeah! <laughs> See, I, I was sad in that moment, but Mace, if you think about it, he's like a good guy Palpatine. Sort of, you know? He's, I mean, he's like a, he's a schemer in that he's always looking for a way to play the game of the Jedi and play strategy and try to ferret out the Sith. Basically, he is becoming so much like the Sith by trying to ferret them out and essentially, without realizing it, beat them at their own game that, you know, if you think about it, he's always thinking of things in the big picture. Palpatine, Palpatine's downfall was that his evil did not allow him to see that good, what good people could do, what individuals could do. And Mace, very similarly, couldn't see people that way. Yeah. And I don't want this to be all about Mace Windu, so we're gonna move, <laughs> we're gonna move on. But um, something that you kind of brought up was the just the way that the Order sort of sees things, and the idea of the Living Force and the growing and changing with the Force. And I don't feel like the Jedi Order in the prequel trilogy really did that very well. I don't. I think that they ignored things like compassion and, you know, one of the things that I really like about the Old Republic era is that they don't have this thing about attachments to where you can't have any. And I think the one thing that makes you a truly compassionate person is being able to have those attachments. And I think the idea of no attachments is something that was part of the downfall of the Jedi Order. And I don't know if either of you agree with that, but I just, I don't like the idea of the no attachments. Um, well, okay, sorry, I'm just really excited to talk about oh, this. Oh, no, go ahead. Go, go for it. Go for uh, it. I think that the no attachments worked 
before the war. And that's because it could be they could focus on their mission of help and being peacemakers and being guardians to some degree. But with the war, they became warriors and warriors with no attachments. What are they fighting for? They're fighting for ideals. They're not fighting for people anymore. They're fighting for ideals, which is a good thing, but only up to a certain point. They became so focused on the mission of winning, the mission of taking out the Sith, that they're not thinking of the people that we have to protect or what are we actually trying to support here? What are we trying to build? What are we really fighting for instead of just fighting the opponents? It, 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 one of the things, at some point along the way, you know, they built all these rules and they ended up on Coruscant and the city of people and they thought they were among the, you know, the living. They knew every, the current, they were in it. But at some point along the way, I'm sure something horrible happened where someone was attached and bad things happened. Some Jedi was powerful. He had an attachment and he fell to the dark side. Something horrible happened, but well, there were probably, a uh, Anakin. you know, sure. Sure well, there had been a there was, story before. There'd probably been uh, several Anakin stories before, but they, the things you always remember are the horrible things that happen, like the nine 11 event, the bad things that happen in your life stick out, but they hadn't remembered all the wonderful things all, even little things that had happened because someone, some Jedi had an attachment and they went above and beyond and maybe made a sacrifice and the horrible thing didn't happen. So that's one of the, those ways where we always are safeguarding against the horrible things that we remember as opposed to recalling all the amazing, wonderful things that also happen. And so they kind of, at some point they made a rule that you can't be, Jedi can't be attached because bad things have happened. But they forgot about all the wonderful things because really in, in a way, and that's what Luke does, right? He reminds you that I, his attachment to his father or the idea of his father is way stronger than anything Palpatine who had taken down the whole Jedi Order could do. And that's that one little shining moment that was stronger than anything. And, you know, so that was how that, but that was what had to happen. Unfortunately, they had to have, they literally, the Jedi Order ended up dying because they forgot all the good things. Right. But I mean, like, here's the case in point of like why I think the Jedi Order, like, set itself up for its own downfall. It's just because something bad happens doesn't mean that you go and hide forever. I mean, it's kind of timely that it's sort of, I think it's the 70th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, um, June 6th of 44. And just because World War II happened and just because, you know, that invasion happened doesn't mean that people don't go to those beaches. It doesn't mean that people have decided to live in bunkers for the rest of their lives you know or like with 9-11 like that we all decided to just hide and no one would ever go overseas anywhere you know you can't just shut down and change change things take away things from people you know and say oh well you know that guy went crazy so therefore now our new philosophy is no attachments I mean that's just not the way that humans work you know, and I, I don't want to think that in order to be a Jedi that I have to be able to, you know, not care about people. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I mean, I know they don't, they encourage people to care and to be compassionate or their members. But, you know, how are you compassionate about towards another person without being able to feel something for that person? And, you know, they built friendships. I mean, you know, it would be ridiculous to say that Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn were not friends or that Qui-Gon and Yoda, or, I mean, Qui-Gon, Yoda, Obi-Wan, any of them, that they were not friends and did not care about each other or that Obi-Wan didn't care about Commander Cody, you know. I mean, it would be ridiculous to say that they did not form those attachments because they clearly did. You know, I just feel like that one thing is kind of a tell all of sort of like how they came to their own doom. And it's sad because you would think that they would have known better. And I would have thought that Yoda would have known better. And that's kind of the thing that makes me sad about Yoda is because 
I believe so much in him from the original trilogy. He's one of my favorite characters. And then to see him in the prequel trilogy and to see him playing the political camp, the political game, you know, and not really doing anything, but all the time just sitting there and going, hmm. But just remember, <laughs> Teresa, in the end, in the end, he did the right thing. True. But I'm just saying. <laughs> well, it's so it's so hard because people, you know, in in real life, um, you know, people get caught up in things and they don't realize all the other things that are driving the decisions they make until it's too late. And so th- mm-hmm. this, that's, you know, Yoda becomes a great parable. And the interesting thing is we met Yoda and we thought he was this great Jedi master. And then we see the prequel trilogies and you see him in a little bit different light. Um, and, well, and so ultimately the end is, can you like, I still respect the Jedi Order. I just think that they they definitely had um, they had some you know arrogance ended up costing them. But it's funny because arrogance ended up costing Palpatine too. So it it's really the the emotion that ended up um, toppling both uh, powers. Well, and and Teresa to talk a little bit about Yoda. I think in some ways Yoda was wary of the arrogance of being the right person. You know, if, if I were on a council of great Jedi whom I trusted and respected, and I thought all of them were wrong about something, I would, I would question myself. I would question if I was being arrogant or if I was missing something. Um, and I think Yoda was I definitely think about arrogance because the level of power that the Jedi hold that that does that brings a proclivity for arrogance and for a downfall of corruption because of too much power. So I, I, I think it's quite possible that Yoda was watching that and then he watched it happen in the order anyway and started figuring it out. Eventually <laughs> it was just a little too late. Yeah, I would agree. I think he started figuring things out, but it was definitely by the time he figured it out it was too late. Um, Mm -hmm. and I would, I would completely agree with that. Um, so what you said about attachments, uh, I think is probably true because if there were like, say the, the several Anakin cases, then what if, um, what if that, that was the case and the order was more, it seems very reactionary. Like if there were a couple of Anakin type case scenarios, and thus that rule was made, and that's how a number of their rules have been brought about. It seems very reactionary, and that leads them into the war. The war happens, and they react to it. Palpatine schemes, and they react to it. The Sith happen, and they react to it. There, there's no longer the foresight there, the wisdom that they need in order to find themselves in a galaxy at war with an evil such as Palpatine, in existence. And instead, they're just reacting to the demands of the environment that they're in. And oddly enough, you saying that brought to mind something that could possibly happen for Episode 7. Dang it. <laughs> oh, no, she's speculating. Oh, no. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going I'm to I'm say it, and then I'll never say it. I'll probably forget that I said it. That... <laughs> The Jedi needed the help of all the ordinary people of the rebellion in order to overcome the Emperor in the original trilogy, because there was only one left, theoretically. Um, so in the sequel trilogy, maybe it's Luke realizing that he needs the help of the everyday person in order to try to rebuild a new way of life for themselves. That's that's actually a, a, a brilliant plot point. One of my favorite plot points in the New Jedi Order book by written by Michael Stackpole. So you are on to something. Good, and I've never read that. Yay! It, and Look Teresa, at me. Just, <laughs> Teresa just speculated. There you yeah, go. And that's never happening again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I think we're, is there anything else anybody wants to say? Cause we're going to get run out of time. So we want to wrap it up. Is there, does everybody have hope for the Jedi order going forward? 
I do. And I want to say that, like, I don't hate the Jedi Order. And I know people are going to be like, oh, my gosh, she hates the Jedi Order. That is not the case. I actually really no. love the Jedi Order, and I love Jedi. I just think that they were very flawed. She, you're well. You're 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 doing your mommy voice. I'm very disappointed in you, Jedi. Well, I was. <laughs> I am. It's sad. I don't know. Oh, poor Jedi Order. <sighs> Bethany, I guess for my concluding thoughts, it's there is a disappointment with seeing that happen, but in some ways. I think that it was somewhat inevitable because the Jedi honestly hadn't grown as an order as much as they thought they had. And I think that they, that they honestly had to learn that the hard way because, I mean, if you do have someone of Palpatine's level of power and evil and intelligence going after you in a galaxy that's as war torn as it is in the prequels, uh, when you're at war like that, you are trying to the best of your ability to protect your ideals and to win battles. And that becomes that becomes the goal of a soldier. And the Jedi turned into soldiers and lost sight of, well, lost sight of who they were, really. Uh, but it, it, it is hard to blame them for that uh, because that's something that has happened over and over in our own earth history is soldiers who sometimes for good and sometimes for ill lose sight of a, of a broader picture. And that can turn into a soldier giving his all to save the lives of the men around him, or that can turn into despicable deeds done in the heat of a battle. So it, it's hard to really fault the Jedi but I wish that they had seen, and I, I wish particularly that Yoda had seen sooner than he did. Good closing statement. Well done. So, Bethany, where can people find you on the interwebs? People can find me on Twitter at Bethany L. Blanton and I host a podcast at StarWarsReport.com where there are a number of Star Wars podcasts, including one that you do, Teresa. But, uh, <laughs> I'm on and off Twitter, and you can follow my, my Star Wars-related stuff there for the most part. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. We are glad to have another fangirl on, especially one that is as brilliant, intelligent, and eloquent as you are. Oh, goodness. You flatter. <laughs> well, no, it's very, very true. Um, and well, we thank also... you for having me. It was, yeah, I really liked being on, and I especially love that I got to be on for this particular character discussion, and so that I wouldn't be too terribly sad because of missing all of you amazing people. <laughs> well, we will try to rectify that soon. Guarantee it. Um, we want to thank everybody so much that you know, contacts us and plays with us, with us online in between shows um, on our Facebook page and our Twitter and things like that. And for the people who send us emails and stuff, we have several people that we want to recognize, but because our interview with Vanessa was as long as it was in the in-depth character discussion, we just didn't have enough time on this episode, but we are planning a big um listener appreciation episode we're going to highlight some amazing fangirl kids um and their parents and things like that so if you want to be included in that here is how you can do that you can find us on twitter at fg going rogue trisha is at fangirl cantina i am at ice cold penguin we do have an instagram um it's at fg going rogue like our twitter um we don't use it as much because instagram makes it difficult to switch between accounts but um, at Fangirl Cantina and at Ice Cold Penguin on Instagram as well to see all of our pictures, especially Star Wars Weekends. You, you can email us at fangirlsgoingrogue at gmail.com. And then our voicemail line, Trisha, this is yours. Voicemail 33121EWOKS or 331-213-9657. We also are on Facebook, and you can search for Fangirls Going Rogue. 
We do have a Tumblr. It is loaded and it goes every day. And that's fangirlsgoingrogue.tumblr.com. And um, yeah, we did already did the Instagram. But yeah, FG Going Rogue. And Teresa has all of us on Instagram. So we do that now. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, I've converted Bethany and Trisha, and I will keep converting. I converted Mark Hamill. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. But if you like seeing lots of Disney stuff, you can follow me. Oh, and while we're here at this point, I want to say happy birthday to Dave Filoni was a few days ago. But today, happy birthday to our own Padme Amidala, Natalie Portman, and our very own Donald Duck turned 80. So happy birthday, Donald. Uh, and Padme wow. and Johnny Depp, who has nothing to do with Star Wars, but it is his birthday. Okay. <laughs> so please go like Rebel Force Radio on iTunes and leave a positive review over there. And in your review, mention how much you like Dan Girls Going Rogue. So until next time, yub. Yub. Nub. <laughs>